Game of Thrones Season 7 Episode 3, The Queen's Justice, has proven to be one of the best episodes yet this season. If this trend continues, that means Episode 4 could be even better. In this video, I want to discuss a few things you may have missed in Episode 3, as well as my overall thoughts and breakdown of the episode. Alright, so first up we have Jon Snow meeting with Misande on the beach, as well as with Tyrion and Davos. Uh, Davos mentions that he's been to the Summer Isles where Misande is from, and he mentions that there are butterflies and palm trees, and Misande doesn't quite respond, but she looks over and smirks at him. He mentions that this place was beautiful. Now, a lot of people think that, oh, that could be, you know, a sign that Misande is not actually from there, as she would have had a remark saying that, yeah, the palm trees are awesome, or yeah, the butterflies are beautiful. I don't think that's the case. The problem here is that Davos is referring to the place where Misande was sold into slavery as beautiful. Her being from there and that traumatic experience having happened to her, I doubt she would call that place anything close to the word beautiful. The reason why I bring this up is because a lot of people think that Misande will in fact be one of Daenerys' three betrayals. I don't think Misande is going to be a betrayer. I think she is exactly who she says she is. The main cause of this theory is that there was a deleted scene that hinted at the fact that one day Misande would betray Daenerys. I do not think that's the case. Tyrion and Jon do share an awesome moment. They uh, refer to each other as the titles and then give each other that smirk. You know, Tyrion calls Jon Snow the bastard of Winterfell. Jon calls Tyrion the dwarf of Casterly Rock. He's actually saying a polite way because Tyrion has several nicknames. Dwarf is one of the more polite terms. But they ultimately end up talking about Sansa, saying that how Sansa... Tyrion remarks how Sansa is smarter than she lets on and Jon Snow says yes she is showing how smart she is and that's awesome because we have a really good moment with Sansa coming up in a bit. That moment where Jon says yeah but I'm not a Stark and then Drogon flies by, that could be probably one of the most subtle and I'm being sarcastic here ways of foreshadowing that Jon Snow is in fact half Targaryen. He is a Stark but he's also half Targaryen. We're shown that Melisandre is actually witnessing this first meeting or this re-meeting between Tyrion and Jon and she's up on a cliff and Varys walks up behind her and he mentions that as much as this guy is your savior, referring to Jon Snow, I figured you would be down there greeting him on the beach. Now this is interesting because Var Varys is kind of being an asshole. He obviously has gotten rid of the Red Priestesses in a sense because he's in Dragonstone and they are obviously not there with Daenerys so the fact that this other Red Priestess has come around Varys is going to take it upon himself to go and try to, you know, send her off. Thing is, is she's already planning on leaving. Varys attempts to put her in place, uh, one would say, but she ends up putting him in place by saying, you know, I'm, I will leave now, but I have to return. I'm going to die in a strange land just like you. And then that eerie music that starts playing, uh, the same music that they used to play back when they were on Dragonstone before, and it was Stannis and Melisandre. This scene could be referring to the voice in the flames that Varys heard when he was a boy when his root and stem were tossed into the flames. Now if Melisandre is in fact actually going to Volantis, I, I believe there could be two reasons why she would travel there. One, it could be because she's trying to find a blacksmith who is capable of wielding and forging Valyrian steel. This is the same place where Tywin got his blacksmith that reforged Ned and how Stark's Valyrian steel sword ice. So she could be going there to get someone who could aid Jon in forging Valyrian steel, or she could be going there to meet with Kinvara. Kinvara is the high priest of the Temple of Valantis, so she could be going there to touch base and mention about Jon Snow. I don't really think Melisandre seemed too interested in serving Danny. She did send her a message. She did tell her that she does have a role to play, but I think she could be going back to touch base with Kinvara, and maybe they can combine their information basically we have Jon Snow who could fit the Azor High Prophecy and you also have Daenerys who could fit the Azor High Prophecy. I think she is going there to explain to Kinvara how Jon Snow was actually brought back to life by their lord and savior, R'hllor. Then we cut to Jon Snow and Daenerys actually meeting in the throne room. Daenerys has her huge list of titles and I loved Misande's way of delivering these titles when she came on to the word breaker of change she goes breaker of chains like i felt a little bit of hip-hop come through maybe a little bit of london grime davos's first attempt at listing Jon snow's titles well they're really short and then Jon snow mentions to daenerys that he needs her help daenerys then mentions that she's got all these dothraki and three dragons why would she need Jon snow's help and then that's when davos steps up and says look this is all the stuff that Jon Snow has done. He's bled for his people. He's the first to unite northern men and wildling men and lead them together in the same army. He's done a lot of great shit too, just like you, Daenerys. Maybe you should have a bit more respect for him. 
Honestly, I think the theme of this whole conversation with everyone is no one really has respect for each other. Like, yes, Tyrion and Jon Snow respect each other. It's That's brought up when Jon says, do you think I'm a liar? Do you think I'm a madman? Tyrion's like, no, I believe that you would not lie, sit here and lie to us. But what we're going to see in these next couple episodes is some moments where they will have to have a little faith in each other. And then that respect will grow from there. Respect is earned, not given. Varys then breaks the awkward silence with news that a Greyjoy ship has returned in news of the battle. So then Danny tells Jon that, pardon my manners, we'll have supper sent to you. And Jon asks, am I a prisoner? And Daenerys says, not yet. Basically saying like, yes, sort of. We took your boat. We took your weapons. You can't leave yet. We'll continue this conversation at another time. It's funny that Varys shows up when he does, which is right after everything is said, where he could have been there explaining to Daenerys how Ned was, who Ned was as a person, and how Ned did not want him to send people to go poison her, but this dude showed up too late. I'm assuming there are two different Greyjoy ships that survived that battle, because we do have Theon showing up after that, and then this ship gets there first. I feel like Theon would have already came up, so his ship is likely right behind the Greyjoy ship that we do see showing up after Melisandre and Varys continue their conversation. Then we cut to Euron parading his gifts for Cersei through the streets of King's Landing. Now, it is known in the novels that all of Euron's gifts are poisoned. So it's interesting that the fate of Tyene, she ends up being poisoned the same way that Ilaria poisoned Marcella back in Season 5. So Cersei returning the gift is returning the gift of death to Ilaria, where Ilaria will be forced to sit and watch Tyene rot. The question is, does Tyene have an immunity since it's the same poison they use to poison Marcella? We are shown that she did have the antidote at one point. Euron does mention to Yara the fact that he has a crowd boner or, you know, basically the fact that everyone is cheering for him is giving him an erection and he pulls Yara close to him. I did notice that Yara, I felt like she might have had something to say, but she was like clenching her jaw shut the entire time, almost as if she might have had her tongue ripped out. Now, when you know, when you look in the novels, and like I had said earlier, all of Euron's gifts are poisoned, basically he gives gifts to Victarion, sends Victarion out to the Marine. Now, Yara sort of has that storyline where she escapes from Euron on the TV show and then goes to try to parlay with Daenerys and bring Daenerys into the fold and helping her win back the Iron Islands. So if you reverse that around a bit, you have a woman with her tongue cut out. She kind of slightly fits the profile of the Dusky Woman. One of the gifts that Euron gives Victarion is the Dusky Woman. We're not really known of her origin, but she has her tongue removed. And Victarion has to remind himself multiple times that all of Euron's gifts are poisoned. But it ends up happening that Victarion sort of takes it on himself to become close with her he ends up telling her some of his deepest and most darkest secrets i think he feels confident in doing this because she doesn't have a tongue and he likes the fact that she can't talk back we are shown pike in the intro we've seen euron every episode we've seen yara every episode and her character has in fact been jumped up to the position of a main character so that means we're going to be seeing a lot more of her i don't think that she's going to fulfill the role of dusky woman per se but she could be around euron long enough to get some vital information and then if she ends up escaping she could relay that information to daenerys and daenerys could use it to help defeat Euron. Then we're shown Cersei rewarding Jaime in a sort of way. Now I will say that I didn't see anyone getting upset online that Cersei basically raped Jaime. Like yes he was into it kind of but he ultimately pulled away and the definition of rape is having sex with someone without their consent. Initially he did not give her consent. It's funny that no one is tripping out of the fact that Jaime was raped. That line that Euron gives Jaime in that scene right before this like basically to Cersei like butt play was pretty brutal. He uh, definitely cut Jaime to the core with that one. Cersei's meeting with the Iron Bank is not her having a kind heart and wanting to keep with the tradition of honoring your guest. She's basically just buying more time from the Iron Bank. Cersei took home the most wins this episode she got to repay a debt to Ilaria in av poisoning Tyene and then forcing Ilaria to watch her die. She also got to hook up with Jamie, and then she got to give more time from the Iron Bank. Flying back over to Dragonstone, we have Jon Snow and Tyrion meeting, and Tyrion asks Jon if he can do Jon a favor, something that he could actually do. Jon Snow then asks for Dragonglass. Tyrion then meets with Daenerys and convinces Daenerys to give Jon Snow the Dragonglass as an act of faith towards possibly having Jon as an ally in the future. John meets with Daenerys on a cliff. Danny allows John to mine the dragon glass. During that meeting with John and Danny on the cliff, she allows him to go and mine dragon glass and forge it. I think that forging line is foreshadowing to the fact that we will be getting Gendry in the next episode. Jon Snow will have to, of course, make weapons out of that dragon glass. So I think this is when Davos brings up 
Gendry. I absolutely loved Sansa's scenes this episode. When we first see her in Winterfell, she is mentioning with Maester Wolken about how she believes that all of the kingdoms in the north should send their food to Winterfell just in case they all have to rush there when the long night happens, when the long winter happens, and it would take them longer to get to Winterfell if they have to also haul their food storages. So she steps up and showing us that she's thinking ahead, and then also she mentions to Lord Jan Royce that his soldiers should be putting leather on top of their breastplates because winter is coming. So this was awesome to see that Sansa is a prepared queen in the north and will do Jon Snow's duty when he is not in Winterfell. Peter Little Fucker, oh I'm sorry, I mean Little Finger Baelish, gives Sansa that speech from the trailer where he's mentioning how fight every battle in your mind everywhere all around you, always be fighting, and Sansa, he looks like he's actually getting towards Sansa, he looks like he's actually making an impact on her, and then guess what, Bran shows up, and him and Sansa have a reunion, now I will be... I will admit that this reunion was nowhere near as touching as the reunion between Jon and Sansa last season, but like I said in my live breakdown trailer, I think that that was because Sansa had been walking around in the wilderness trying to reach the wall for who knows how long, starving, freezing cold, so of course it's going to be more impactful with all of that happening to her. Now, when she meets Bran, she's been at home in Winterfell, she had the battle of the bastard, she got through all that, she's been sleeping in a warm bed, and she's well fed, so it's not going to be as impactful as that initial meeting between Jon and Sansa. Bran has like the ultimate dick moment. He starts proving to Sansa that he has seen everything, he knows everything. Sansa asks him before he says that he's Bloodraven. Now that he's home, he's the last true son of Ned Stark. He is technically the Lord of Winterfell. And he's like, I don't want that, I'm the Blood Raven. And then he goes into explaining to Sansa how he's the Blood Raven. He starts describing the night where she got raped, where she first got raped by Ramsay and he was mentioning how beautiful it was and he does tell her that he can only see bits and pieces So I think the only reason why he was being this big of a dick is because he didn't see that she later on got raped that night And that memory made her really upset obviously as it would for anyone who had suffered rape now, Personally, we didn't see Bran in episode 2 so we saw him in episode 3 So that mean a little bit more time had passed and then more time had passed from the end of season 6 into season 7 I would like to see his powers a bit more developed now. There's this theory that when northern men pray to a weirwood tree or when they work using the weirwood tree the faces on the tree actually look similar to their face now if you remember last season when bran was showed the origin of the white walkers that tree looked exactly like blood raven so i think that only happens once they use it in an extensive time so i'll relate that back to what blood, blood raven told bran which was if you stay too long underneath the sea you'll drown that could be the reason why bran is taking it in strides where he hasn't fully embraced his gift yet like obviously he's let the floodgates loose like he's watching everything but he's not staying in that weirwood net for too too long because if he does he knows that he may potentially be stuck there. I would like to see, by the end of this season, I would like to see Bran be able to show someone a vision. And I think that's maybe how Jon Snow's true lineage is revealed. Captain Friendzone himself also took a W this episode. His grayscale was cured. The way it was cured was a bit unbelievable. Like, I, we all knew it was going to work when Sam was doing this. But Sam was not, it was just not, Sam was mad close. And I think at one point, he actually put the hand that he was using to scrape off this shit. He put it on his lips. So that's direct contact with grayscale. And I honestly think that it's a little bit crazy that somehow Jorah wasn't all bandaged up and wasn't in even more pain. He had just basically had himself flayed. But that aside, it is cool to see the Ebros now has put a little bit more faith in Sam. So I think even though Sam was punished because he had to copy all those old texts, I think in those old texts will be something of grave importance to the show. Like maybe a secret Targaryen marriage book. And the reason why that book has paper mites is because Targaryens have been around for so long. So maybe Rhaegar and Lyanna's marriage is recorded in that book. Maybe there's a scroll on how to make Valyrian steel. Who knows? But Sam was ultimately rewarded by having to copy those texts. Sam's obviously going to have to touch and get these paper mites on his hand and they're going to bite him. What if paper mites are also a secret cure for grayscale? And we are shown that battle that we were given much of in these trailers before the season even started. Grey Worm and the Unsullied take Casterly Rock. Now there are several moments that I have issues with in this scene, but I'll just take a few here. Tyrion mentions that Tywin has built Casterly Rock, and that's not true, because obviously building something as massive as this would take centuries. I think what he more meant is figuratively that, that Tywin basically gave it the reputation that it has. Tywin did rebuild House Lannister, as in no one respected House Lannister before Tywin was promoted Lord of Casterly Rock. Reigns of fucking Castamere. I don't think Tyrion meant that in the literal sense. Grey Worm is successful in taking Casterly Rock, 
The battle was alright, it was kind of a letdown, but then he realizes that the battle was a little bit too easy because half of the troops had gone to take Highgarden. Euron then shows up on the horizon right white as Grey Worm figures out that there's something off. Jamie is successful in taking Highgarden. He learned from his battle with Rob that he needs to split up his troops and he needs to act wisely. So he sent some of his troops to guard Castle Rock, but ultimately it was of no strategic value. So he then confronts Olena. Olena ends up having a few witty lines and she ultimately drinks poison allowed by Jamie. Jamie pours poison in a wine glass. Olena drinks it and then proceeds to tell Jamie that she has a message for Cersei. And that message is that Olena, the Queen of Thorns, Tyrell is responsible for killing Joffrey and that she didn't realize the poison would be that dramatic, but she did it and Jamie kind of is like, hey, well, fuck you. And then he walks away. The only other thing I didn't like about this moment was the fact that they skipped over the actual siege of Highgarden. I felt like with the increased budget this episode, having two battles in one episode would be dank as fuck and they kind of dicked us on that one. I want to give a super special thank you to Enid, Terry, Justin Stone, Darton, Joe Swag, Lynn Shaw, and Angel. Without you all, these videos would not be possible. And if you all watching would like to become a patron, all you have to do is click the link up here, or you can check the link down below in the description, and that can take you where you can show some support for Sir Hunt's reviews. I want to thank you all so, so much for watching. The like goal for this video will be 150. If you could, please subscribe, and then go ahead and turn your notifications on, so that way you get an alert every time I drop Game of Thrones content. If you would like to be entered into my contest to win this Funko Mystery Pop Game of Thrones figurine, all you have to do to enter that contest is like this video, subscribe, and then comment down below. My name's Mark, and this has been Sir Hunt's Reviews.